Hello again. As you know, I am Eli, the computer guy. Today, we are going to be doing an interview with the global CMO of NetScout, so the chief marketing officer of NetScout. And if you're sitting there and you're thinking, NetScout, Eli, what's NetScout? That was honestly my opinion originally. Originally, I had not heard of NetScout, and now I feel sheepish because I hadn't heard of it. So just so you know how this all this all transpired, basically I have been a huge fan of Fluke for years and years and years and years. I believe Fluke is like the apple of network testing equipment in all imaginable ways. One, it's incredibly good quality stuff that will just last forever, and it will cost you an arm and a leg. Basically, when you look at Fluke equipment, Fluke network testing equipment, it's about like when people buy uh, buy buy MacBook Pros. Like if you are a professional content creator, you think it is worth the money to spend twenty eight hundred dollars on a MacBook Pro because you're going to be using the MacBook Pro day in day out, and you you will spend an extra couple of thousand dollars just to make sure you have a system that works when you need it to work. The same thing is true with with Fluke network testing equipment. Basically. Oh, it's eye-watering. Some of the prices can be eye-watering, like $5,000 for a piece of network testing equipment. But but if your job is day in, day out to do network testing, frankly, spending an extra couple thousand dollars for a device that just does what the hell it's supposed to do every single day for years and years and years is worth the price. So uh, so I've been a fan of, of Fluke for years. I've done a, I've done a few... Uh, a few reviews over the years, basically had a relationship with them. And then the last time they sent me a product, um, I was going to do the review. And I said, yep, I'm going to do the review on the Fluke, whatever the hell it was, AirCheck G2. And they're like, wait a minute, wait, no, 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 it's not not the Fluke AirCheck G2. It is the NetScout AirCheck G2. And I sat there and I was like, huh, who the hell's NetScout? <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, I, th- I thought I was going to do a review on Fluke. Who the hell are these NetScout people? Um, and so basically had a had a nice little conversation with them. Found out that NetScout uh, purchased Fluke, or purchased, as we'll, t- we'll show in the interview, they purchased like a part of Fluke, kind of, sort of. Um, and so all of this, uh, this high-end network testing gear is now NetScout network testing gear and not Fluke. So again, that's one thing. If you, if you see my reviews in the past for these higher-level uh, network testing uh, piece of equipment uh, you'll be looking for for NetScout and so I started talking with them and then come to find out they are actually a pretty damn large company again if you've heard of uh, if you've heard of Arbor Networks Arbor Networks is a part of their company again Fluke is a part of their company Arbor Networks is a part of their company they're actually rather large I think they, I think they I think uh, the CMO said that they have something like a thousand salespeople so if you haven't heard of NetScout again why I like doing these interviews is because we can talk to these companies and we can learn Learn about these products from from pretty big, pretty substantial companies that you just simply haven't heard of. Um, I've heard some people be snarky with my my interviews and say, "Oh, you say that you're you're talking to leaders in the tech industry, but who are you really talking to?" And again, one thing for for the viewers out there to realize is a lot of the leaders in the tech industry, they're not Bill Gates and they're not Steve Jobs, they're not Wozniak. And again, I'm not saying anything. I'm not saying anything against Mark Zuckerberg, but that's like. That's like that level, right? But there's a lot of people with companies of a hundred people or a thousand people or a few thousand people that are doing really, really significant things that create products that run the the internet, that run all of these things that we use, but you just don't hear about them. Again, Arbor Networks, if you haven't heard about Arbor Networks, they're one of the premier companies for, for uh, defending against their, uh, denial of service attacks. Again, very important right now. But how many of you folks have heard of Arbor Networks? So, anyways, we're going to be talking about the C- talking to the CMO of NetScout today. A lot of good, interesting information there. Um, and again, like I say, my personal opinion. Right now, they're not paying me. <laughs> right now, they're not paying me. Uh, <clears throat> they haven't paid me in the past. No, no monetary compensation up until this point. Um, but uh, but I like their products. I've reviewed their products. I've purchased Fluke uh, equipment in the past. Um, so if you haven't taken a look at NetScout um, or any of their stuff, you definitely should take a look at it. And like I said, we'll go and we'll do the interview today. So uh, so with that, let me talk about our sponsors for a second. Because again, sponsors are what help pay the bills and make all of this happen. Because again, giving you folks giving you folks good quality content, these good great quality interviews. The CPMs just aren't great on this. The CPMs aren't great. I did a video yesterday talking about why I voted for Trump. Man, that has tens of thousands of views. 
you know, I did an interview with the uh, project manager or whatever for Savius, um, and that has like 2,000 views. So, so why sponsors are important and why clicking on the sponsors is important is because what I mean, these interviews are incredibly high value. I honestly believe that from the bottom of my heart. Um, but the CPM, um, I, I would starve to death off the CPM of these videos. So, anyways, let's talk about the uh, the sponsors and then jump into the interview. So, the first sponsor we have is Veeam, V E E A M, the free backup for PCs, VMs, and Linux, all at Veeam.com. Dev Mountain, Dev Mountain is a 12 week web development, iOS, and UX design bootcamp intended to get you a full time job in the industry. Learn to code at DevMountain.com. INE, INE specializes in network training with hands on labs, on site bootcamps, and a focus on delivering the best in online networking courses. INE.com. Schooly Mitchell. Schooly Mitchell's purpose is to increase clients' profit by reducing telecom costs using software and processes at no risk. We only share savings. SchoolyMitchell.com. Plixer. With scrutinizer and flow data, users can determine what traffic is on the network, who is working the traffic, and who is receiving it. Plixer.com. And finally, Gilware Data Recovery. Gilware's partner programs help computer repair and IT professionals make money by offering data recovery services to their customers. Gilware.com. As I say, I don't care if you thumb up, thumb down, leave a comment, or subscribe, but if you could click on the links below, that is what helps pay the bills. And I, I, I'm just saying, you know, if the, the global CMO for, uh, for NetScout is watching this video right now, I, I, have, a good, I have a good sponsorship package. I, I give you good click-through rates. <laughs> Remember, as I tell all you viewers out there, never stop selling, never stop selling. But anyways, with that, let's jump into this interview because I think it's very interesting. And again, um, they create really good, again, they, they haven't paid me a dime so far. Uh, but they create really good products. These are really, this is like the industry, really good stuff. Um, so, uh, so if nothing else, you should definitely, you should definitely learn more about them. So I'm here with Jim McNeil, the uh, global CMO of NetScout, and we're going to be talking about they have a lot of products for uh, basically network maintenance, understanding what's going on with your network. So we're going to be talking with them today, understanding where their products are, who their demographics are, how you actually learn about their products and buy their products, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. Nice to meet you, Eli. So, so the big thing is, so, so I do a lot of interviews, and one of the things I always tell folks is always make sure you know who the hell you're talking to with a company. Because like, depending on who you're talking to, you will get a different story about the products and services. So you're the global CMO for NetScout. So what, what's, what's your job at NetScout then? Uh, my primary job at NetScout is to be the protector of the brand. Okay. You know, to define the brand, create the brand, do the positioning and the messaging of the company. You know, what's our reason for being? You know, why, why should people, you know, think about NetScout, care about NetScout, do business with NetScout? You know, what's, what's the value behind the name? Right. And so, and then in addition to that, the way I do that is I run advertising and web and events and analyst relations and press and social. And so all of those things that push content out into the ether, yeah. into the world of, of all of your viewers and listeners, that's, that's what I focus on. Okay. Then for, for my viewers and for most people with a CMO, should they be thinking about interacting with a CMO of a company or like if they were interested in NetScout, who would they most likely contact? What's Well, I think your, your viewers would most likely contact our sales force. You know, we have a thousand plus salespeople around the world oh, really? wow. uh, who are willing to get in the car and drive in and sit in your lobby for hours on end just to get your time. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Well, I guess I, then, then that goes into... Let's talk a little bit about like what NetScout is, because I ran into I I didn't know about NetScout honestly. Like I've been a fan of Fluke for years. I consider Fluke like the Apple of network testing equipment. Right. Got, contacted you folks, thought you were Fluke, got a Fluke piece of equipment in. They're like, no, 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 we're NetScout. So then, so then, who is like NetScout, and how long have you been around for? Yeah. Um, I mean, great names, right? Fluke. I mean, I grew up as an engineer. I used Fluke multimeters. Yeah. I used Tektronix oscilloscopes. You know, I mean, I, I cut my teeth on that stuff. It's really fantastic gear. Yeah. Um, we acquired uh, what was called Danaher Communications. Danaher is a 20 billion plus major uh, conglomerate that happened to own those brands. Hmm. Okay. Um, they also owned Arbor Networks. They also owned VSS Networks. They owned Air Magnet. Um, and so they were not really a tech company. They weren't really geared to be a tech company. They're far more industrial and healthcare. And it made a lot of sense for NetScout, who was the leader in service assurance of both the enterprise space and the service provider space to 
to really take over those those businesses. So back in uh, 2014, we, we made an offer to buy that company. Uh, we closed in July of 2015. Uh, it was a $2.3 billion acquisition. Wow. We acquired about $850 million in revenue with that acquisition. Uh, today, uh, you know, NetScout's you know, $1.2 billion revenue company. Um, and we are the, the definitive market share leader in, in network, continuous network monitoring and management. Uh, so what we did, and the reason it makes sense, yeah. is that you know the people that, that watch your program and, and, and what you're talking about, you know, I, I call these people the guardians of the connected world. You know, they are absolutely imperative. They they design the networks, they build the networks, they they monitor and manage the networks, and now they are deploying and delivering you know new applications and new services almost on a daily basis. Yeah. And that's a really cool job, but it's a hard job because it's not so much that we have to build things faster than we've ever built them before, but we're doing it on a moving platform. You know, now we're virtualized, we're dealing with NFE, network function virtualization, especially in the carrier space. You know, all those big hardware appliances are becoming software appliances. Um, we're talking about SDN, software defined networks, that's changing the way we do things. We've got containers, we've got microservices. So, you know, our our customers who are responsible for making sure that they are behind flawless delivery of continuous digital services yeah. have a tough job. Yeah. And we want to help them do that job better. And so it's not enough just to say, you know, here's a data collector that's going to consume all the traffic in the environment and allow you to analyze it and understand what's going on in real time. Yeah. There's more to it than that now because we have a wireless network. That's what you're looking at when you look at AirCheck, right? Yeah. We have a wireless network. We've got some Yahoo in the parking lot who's pretending to be NetScout. And I've got people in the building that are logging into his rogue you know, uh, hotspot and he's stealing their, their password and their credentials. You know, that's happening all over the place. I can't tell you how many intelligence agencies in the United States use that technology hmm, to figure out you know, who's poaching on their network. Oh, right? okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so what's... What's important about NetScout, and what I think the reason we're valid and relevant to your viewers, is what we do as professionals in this industry is more important today than it ever has been historically. Yeah. Uh, the the risk is greater, what's at stake is greater, and it changes so much faster than it ever has before. Okay. You know what we saw happen in the last five years is probably going to happen in the next eighteen months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So things are moving really quickly. So what people can do at NetScout is we collect all the data that goes through your enterprise. So whether it's wireless or it's wired, okay. if it's at 10 gig, 40 gig, 100 gig, we collect it. <laughs> you know, we can store up to 192 terabytes of data in a 3U rack, I mean a 3U you know, uh, appliance. Okay. You know, so you can have petabytes of data that you're recording. And you might ask the question, why would I do that? Petabytes, great. Yeah. Did yeah. you ever see the Black Mirror episode where the where humans could kind of rewind things in their brain? No, I still need to see Black Mirror. I haven't seen it yet. No. Oh, you got to see it. Yeah. You know, so basically, you have an argument with your wife, and you said that's not what you said. And you go, -a 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 -a, and yeah. it goes up on the screen and says, "This is what you said." It's a really good way to get in trouble, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what we can do for the network. That's what we can do for the enterprise. That's why you record that stuff. Yeah. So you can go back and you can replay that unified communication session. You can replay that video conference call. You can go back and look at those messages. You really? can find out you know, which NIC is doing a broadcast storm. If you have an exfiltration of important data, you can figure out, okay, who you know, connected up the FTP server? You know, who pushed that stuff out of the building? Huh. Right? So wow. That's why that stuff's relevant. And, um, and that's why people pay to store it. But you don't want to store it all. You want to store just what you need. So That's interesting. I didn't, didn't know you did the historical. So, so with that, do you, do you pump to your own data, data storage systems? Or do you, do you pump to, to like, other, like EMC or something? Yeah, we, well, we do our business and we deliver our solutions in a number of different packages. You could say that we're a software company that delivers it in a 50-pound box um, <laughs> yeah. because... You know, our appliances, like I said, we, we instrument Verizon and, and AT&T and Vodafone. And so the biggest of the big. So really high scale, you know, large volume, high capacity networks. Um, and they have, you know, huge needs for storage. Our, our top box, which is the 9700 uh, Infinistream, uh, stores 192 terabytes per three use. Perfect. 
heard uh, that. So you can you can rack those together and stack them all you want and store all you want. Huh. You don't have to store on our storage, but you can. So just out of curiosity, like approximately, how much would that cost? Well, the the, the lowest end of what we do starts at about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars okay. for a physical appliance. Yeah. Okay. And then it goes up from there. <laughs> I mean, you get into the millions pretty quickly. Huh. And you said. Uh, you said those are the Inf Infinistream products. Yeah. So the okay. the Infinistream is is the collector okay. and the organizer, right? It yeah. organizes and analyzes data. So when you think about the fact that you're collecting every single packet that's coursing through your network, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that you don't want to keep around. <laughs> you know, for instance, when you've got mail people, you know, at the distribution station sorting letters to fill their pouches. They're not opening up the envelopes and looking inside. Yeah, yeah. You know, they've got a to address, they've got a from address. That's really relevant. You know, there's a timestamp on there. They know when this thing has moved from point A to point B. Same thing with FedEx. You track a package. Yeah. Think about tracking the package the way a packet moves through a network. That metadata is really important. Hmm. It's very rare that the content of the envelope is relevant. Yeah. It can be. Like, for instance, if we have a mobile app that we want to understand what's really going on in that mobile app, maybe there's error codes that we want to check if it's an Oracle database. Yeah. You know, there's a number of Oracle error codes that we might want to read and understand. But in most cases, you're looking at the metadata. So instead of you know, storing a terabyte of, um, of, of packet information, you may store 10 megabytes you know, yeah. because you really strip it down. And that has to happen in a distributed fashion. You know, a lot of our competitors will collect the data and move it to a central location. Yeah. And that itself is just impacting your network. You know, okay. we do everything out at the edge. You know, you basically, you know, take all the information out at the edge. You do all your processing there. You move just the stuff that you need to move. And then you can do really quick analysis on it. So what are you doing? You're capturing the relevant data. You're time stamping it. That time stamp is consistent across the entire global network. So you can correlate events. You know that. You know, this time is the same in New York as it is in Hawaii, so you can know what's happening, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's a lot going on. So Infinistream is that data collector, analyzer, organizer. Ingenious One is the presentation layer. That's the application your customers are going to see. That's the one with all of the all the graphs and the charts and the you know the the, the dashboard that gives them all the alerts and so forth. And the all the stuff that we do is service oriented. This is something that's very different about NetScout. Yeah. You know, when you think about a complex network, um, the network guys think about servers, they think about storage, they may, they may think about their database servers, yeah. but that's not how the, the, the CIO team and the operations team's thinking. Yeah. They're thinking about, I've got the financials, I've got the CRM application, I've got my SFA application. You know, they're thinking about the services, I've got my customer portal. That customer portal is not a single monolithic application. That customer portal is a web server, an app server, an authentication piece. There's LDAP there. There's a load balancer. Yeah. There's there's maybe there's there's encryption involved if we're doing SSL. So it's all these things together. Hmm. And so to say something is wrong with the customer portal could mean any number of things are wrong. Yeah. So when you, when I say you're service oriented. The service you're monitoring and the error code that comes up in that little circle or the percentage of failures is about that portal. Hmm. But when you click on it, it gives you all the sub-services that comprise it. Yeah, okay. And you can see, oh, it's not the database, it's the load balancer. Click, and now I see what's wrong with the load balancer. So two clicks. Wow, wow. The most complex of enterprises, you can get to the root cause of a problem. Damn, that's cool. So then, so then who... I guess who is like the target user geek for this? Because that's one of the questions that comes up. Is it like the MCSE, the CCNP, would it be the IT director? Like who actually uses this product on a day-to-day? -day? Yeah, like, it's changing. It's changing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it has historically been, you know, the, the, the director of network operations, right? Yeah. You know, the PP of network ops and his team. Yeah. Um, but it's changing in a couple of ways. Uh, number one, it's changing because the packet is the single version of the truth. Okay. This is what really happened. It's not a report of what happened. It's what happened. Yeah, yeah. Right? So log data can be useful for a lot of things, but log data can also be perverted. You know, it could be it could be messed with. Yeah. Uh, you know, wire data is the real deal. So increasingly, a lot of security teams are taking an interest in wire data, especially for forensics, okay. to be able to figure out what happened. 
They, right. they want to see the wire data. So security is interesting. The other thing that's happening is when you look at DevOps, yeah. you know, just a couple of years ago, maybe five or ten percent of the enterprises have even heard the term. Yeah. You know, recently Forrester did a survey, forty percent of of forty thousand large enterprises in the United States say they have a DevOps operation. So we're shifting from waterfall and agile to continuous deployment and development of services. Yeah. You want to be able to compete with Uber and Airbnb? Yeah. You want to be able to stay ahead of the curve? You know, you've got to be moving in this direction. And so a lot of our customers are doing that, hmm. or roughly half. Yeah. Um, and, and what that does is it, it shifts the burden significantly um, from the developers who are under the gun to constantly provide you know, new capabilities and new services to the operations teams who are receiving builds you know, sometimes every day. And, and so this is continuous thing. So what happens, I, I kind of like to think about, you know, DevOps, you know, kind of like your high school experience or your middle, middle school experience, you know. Yeah. When, you, when you're in middle school, you know, you have your own group of friends and everything is fine. And then you go to high school and you're surrounded by, you know, five other, you know, towns that you never knew before yeah. come into the same place. And now you have to deal with all these new personalities. Yeah. That's what it's like when you take an application out of the sandbox uh, development and you throw it over the wall into operations. Because there's a whole, bottle, a whole bunch of new stuff out there that you didn't know about. Yeah, there's yeah. a unified communication system that's running. You know, yeah. there's you know, Office 365 is talking to 140 URLs in the cloud. You know, what's that going to do, right? Yeah. So, what we do is we have the ability because we're service oriented, because we see all the traffic that goes through an environment, because we can establish a baseline yeah. of behavior. As soon as something pops up, and it's an anomaly over the ordinary course of, of, of behavior, yeah. we could set an alert. We could, take, we could say, look, something's going on. You rolled out this new app. It is, it is pinging this Oracle database like incessantly, and there's a problem. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Or you have this new group of, 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 of IoT devices. Yeah. Uh, you're in a hospital. Yeah. You just rolled out a whole bunch of Wi-Fi communicators to the neonatal unit, and all of a sudden, they're pinging, you know, some IP address outside of our domain. Okay. Yeah. What the heck is going on here? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So to summarize what we do as a company, yeah. um, you think about if you really want to get a handle on how your enterprise is behaving uh, on an ordinary day so that you can determine what's happening on a unordinary day, yeah. day, you know, it's surveillance is what it breaks down to. It's, it's high yeah. scale high performance, continuous 24 seven surveillance yeah. of what's going on in an enterprise. Hmm. So then with the ingenious, would this be something that then theoretically five or 10 people in the, in the operations group could have installed on their systems? Yeah, what you do, yeah. and, and this, is the, this is what's happening in the larger, you know, more sophisticated enterprises, yeah. you, you instrument your environment, right? You can't fix what you don't measure. Yeah. yeah. Okay? So you instrument the, the critical paths in your environment, and then each person, if you're the database guy, you know, you're gonna care about the services that are associated with Oracle, right? Yeah. So that's your screen. That's all you have to look at. Okay, yeah. Right? yeah. Yep. Uh, if I'm the CIO, I may have a screen that breaks down like this, CRM, SFA, finances, you know, financials, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And every one of those tiles may represent one person in my team. Okay, yeah. And they're focused on what's under those tiles. Okay. So then, is this something, is this an app that then would get installed on the computer, or is this a server with basically a web GUI interface then? Yeah, it's, it's think of it as a cloud app, you know, it's but cloud. it's in your cloud, right? Yeah. So uh, the whole interface is browser-based. Okay. Um, it could run, I mean, if you're in New York and you've got a net network distributed across, you know, North America, yeah. it doesn't matter. You could run the thing from New York. Okay. You know, that's why if it's going into the private co public cloud or private cloud, you could deal with it there as well, <laughs> you know. So you, you, you instrument where your traffic is moving, but where you do your analysis and your, your management is independent of that. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Then, then when you're talking about that, though, it is curious going back to the whole like purchasing fluke. Because when you're talking about a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar minimum purchase on a on appliance plus all, I mean these these are going to be millions of dollars deployments, and then you go down to fluke with the very cute little two thousand dollar 
web analyzer. How, how does Fluke then fit in? Yeah, how does that? Fluke fit into the story? Yeah, yeah. You, you asked the right question. You know, why do we, um, you know, why, why abandon the, the Fluke brand, right? It, yeah. It's such a powerful brand. It has great equity. Um, the answer is uh, because we had to. <laughs> because yeah, oh, okay. You know the 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 multimeter that that may still be in your your toolbox yeah, yeah, yeah. is is owned by Fluke. Okay. Right. So Fluke still exists. Fluke Instruments. So Fluke still. still oh, really? Okay. Fluke Instruments is, still exists. Huh. Fluke Fluke Networks. Yeah. Which is AirCheck and OptiView and Link Runner and Link Sprinter and you know all those products, Air Magnet. Uh, those are now Netscout products. Oh, okay. So with our deal with Fluke, we needed to abandon the Fluke brand. Yeah, okay. And we also needed to abandon the Tektronix brand. Hmm, okay. Because Tektronix oscilloscopes yeah. still belong to Danaher, right? Huh, so okay. we, we took all the network products, and they kept all of the lab products, if you will. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Huh, okay. So let's talk about, you said, you know, how do you get from 125 grand as an entry level, you know, conversation down to even a thousand bucks, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's different, different horses for different courses. I mean, a company, you know, with, with a couple hundred people um, can can do a lot with uh, the Fluke tools. Yeah. So, with um, and, and increasingly, a lot of these companies are relying much more heavily on wireless. Yeah, yeah. And even even larger enterprises. I don't know if you've watched what's going on with the Cisco digital ceiling. You know, but we, with power over Ethernet, yeah. we're not just going to be driving Bluetooth sensors in the ceiling. We're going to be driving LED lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to be driving the whole user experience inside of the boardroom. Okay. And they're going to know how many phones are in the room and how much Wi-Fi to allocate to that space. And those Bluetooth devices are going to talk to your phones. And there's going to be all this amazing automation going on. Yeah. And without understanding how that network is performing, and it's all wireless there, yeah. the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi and so forth, you know, you're going to be really at a loss. Um, we, have, uh, we have a hospital client that is currently managing 6 million square feet of wireless network <laughs> Wow. Yep. using, using AirCheck and OptiView. Really? Okay. Right? Okay. So it starts with the basics. Um, you are, uh, even, even Eli, the computer guy, you know, you're doing one of two things. You're either consuming cloud services or you're delivering services from the cloud. Yeah, yeah. That kind of defines any business I talk to. You're either serving it up or you're consuming it. Yeah. Um, we have a product that you can buy for $1,000, yeah. which is called the, the Ingenious Pulse. Okay. And the Ingenious Pulse can make phone calls. It can test you know, you know, voice over IP. Hmm. Um, it can ping any number of websites. So let's say, you know, for you, Eli, there's 15 companies that you've signed up to use. Maybe you're using Adobe Creative Cloud, you use Adobe Premiere, yeah. you know, you use Office 365, maybe you use Dropbox. You know, so you got like maybe 10 or 15 of these things that you care about. You go and you list those URLs inside of Pulse, yeah. and it checks them all the time for you. <laughs> and it holds those companies accountable to the SLA that they promised to you. Nice. And then... You may say, okay, well, look at Eli, the computer guy website. Am I providing the services that I need to to my customers? Yeah. You point your pulse at that as well. Huh. And you can check it out. So think about what happens if you are Jiffy Lube yeah. and you've got 100 diff different Jiffy Lubes across the, you know, the West. Yeah. You can put a pulse in every single one of those environments and you can point them to all the services that Jiffy Lube is consuming. Mm -hmm. And I can test how Jiffy Lube is responding to corporate. Yeah. So it's a really simple product. It's really powerful. Now, does that, do you, again, like I say, if you have 50 or 100 whatever Jiffy Loops, do you have one console where you can see all that information from yeah. the 50? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it, it, looks, uh, it looks a lot like your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It'll run here. Okay. Um, huh. and, uh, and it runs on a web, right? Yeah. And then you've got great products like, you know, the, the Link Sprinter. Uh, let's say that you're you're working at a college, yeah. and you've got to manage you know 2,000 dorms, you know, with Ethernet ports, and you know class is going to start in the fall. Yeah. How do you know all those things are going to work? Well, you can go from room to room 
you could plug your your, your sprinter into the wall, yeah. and then you could take a picture of of that port and its port address, right. and you get an email that says, okay, we we verified the the ping from you know this port address to to Google. Here's your time. Yeah. This is the path it took, and then you. You, you take a picture of that port, you attach it, and it goes up into that database. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that when someone says, why is this not working? You actually go in and say, well, because there's a piece of gum on the damn RJ45. That's why it doesn't work, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's all the way down at the bottom. Those products are really, really useful. Um, and what you could do, you know, just checking out, uh, even at home, for you, Eli, you know, like the Link Sprinter, um, it, it doesn't have a display on it. It just has LEDs. Yeah, that okay. show you that you've you've successfully completed the test, and then all of the data shows up here. Hmm. Wow! Uh-huh. All of, this is your user interface. Yeah, you know, so that's pretty cool. Um, same thing is true. We have a, another hospital client that sends an OptiView out to the field. They give it to a twenty-five dollar an hour person yeah. whose job is to walk every square foot of every floor of the hospital. Okay. With that OptiView yeah. and map the radio network. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Right? And they don't have to know what they're doing. They just have to walk the floor. And then they package up the you know, the, the data, it ships to corporate, and then corporate can lay it out and see exactly what the performance is for that network. So the, the wireless engineer can sit at corporate and make determinations as to how they need to add hotspots and access points. Yeah. But he never had to get on a plane. Damn, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So then that's a thing like so most of the companies I talk to they've got two three four maybe five products so it's pretty easy to understand what you should buy you have so many things going on like somebody who's interested is like holy crap NetScout has something they want to buy like how how do they how do they grasp what products you have and how do they figure out what they may want yeah it's it's a really it's a good question um, well I think the way they start is if you have a desire to make sure that your network is working all the time. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you should call us. Okay. Because we could we could help you solve that problem. And and so you're going to tell me, you know, yeah, we're really heavily dependent upon wireless, or we're not just in North America. We've got MPLS circuits, you know, going to London and Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we have a data center. You know, you know, this is what we need to figure out. So, depending on on what your pain points are and your requirements, it determines what we bring to the party. Um, the other thing that you may not be aware of, because I mean, obviously, Fluke was a surprise to you. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Arbor Networks? Yeah, yeah, I know about Arbor. Yeah. Yeah. So we own Arbor. Okay. Okay. So Arbor is the world's premier provider of denial of service protection software. Yeah. And they're also in the business of advanced persistent threat. And the reason Arbor makes sense to be part of NetScout is we consume the same content. We consume wire data. They use wire data to identify cyber threats, yeah. right? So when you go to deploy a visibility framework inside of your large complex enterprise, you use a packet flow switch. Yeah. Packet flow switch collects the data at all the key points, and then it determines what tools need that data hmm. and what type of data those tools need, yeah. right? And then it directs that data to those devices, including Things like Spectrum Advanced Persistent Threat, including DDoS appliances, yeah. including load balancers and firewalls, right? Okay. So, and including InfiniStream, which needs that data to analyze network performance and make decisions, right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, it's it's complicated because it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, that's that's the answer. Um, but we, if you think about the life cycle of a packet, yeah. It starts here, yeah. it goes through a radio network, it lands on a wired network, and may go through a wireless network inside of an enterprise or a home, yeah. lands again on some server somewhere, and then it gets forgotten about for the rest of eternity, right? Yeah. We, we, we cover that whole space. Okay. So whether it's going over an analog phone network or a 4G network or even someday soon a 5G network, we're the guys that instrument those environments. Yeah. We're the guys that watch the radio access networks that AT&T and Verizon deploys. We're the guys that tell them how to move the antenna to increase the number of bars that you have, you know, you know, on, on I-95. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, yeah, it's, there's a lot of stuff that NetScout does, but 
I would say, you know, down at the basics, we help digital services run flawlessly all the time. So then if I was going to buy this, so like with different companies, do they buy this from you? Do they buy this from dealers? Do they buy this from CDW? Like, so somebody contacts you and like, so they, they want an installation. Who's, who are they actually buying that from? Yeah. And yeah, I wish I could just give you yes or no questions. <laughs> right answer to that. It's just, I wish it was that easy. Yeah. All of the, all the handheld instruments yeah. that, that NetScout sells yep. for the most part, you know, the stuff that you typically would review yeah, yeah. is, is available through channels. Okay. So it's at CEW, it's at Amazon. You can go to Amazon, type in NetScout. Yeah. You're going to see a bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, the, the more sophisticated complex stuff like Infinistream, pack of flow switches and genius one, we sell that direct. You sell that direct. Okay. You know, we have about a thousand salespeople around the world who'll come in and sit in your lobby. Okay. Um, and then, you know, Arbor, uh, most people would be happy to learn that, that most of the, the major carriers that they buy network, uh, access from have Arbor as, as a provider of DDoS. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So they're, their number one target customer is a service provider, Okay. Yeah, yeah. but it's becoming increasingly important for large enterprises to have DDoS as well. Um, and not just one. Yeah. Can't just have one DDoS. Yeah. You can't just have one DNS. Yeah, yeah. you know, because it's you, know, you got one DNS. You saw what happened to Dyn, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, and anybody who had one DNS was down. If you had two or three, you probably were still up and running. Yeah. You know? so what What is the price point of Arbor? Because price, Arbor used to be brutally expensive. I mean, like, what, where where does Arbor come in nowadays? Yeah, um, I I actually don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Isn't that embarrassing? Yeah, I, I, I don't know how to charge for Arbor. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it gets kind of complicated. It depends on, you know, how much bandwidth is moving through your network. So yeah, okay. it's not an easy answer. Um, but it's, you know, for most of us, it's available by, you know, from our carriers. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you're a large enterprise, it's going to be bought by the enterprise. I mean, all the banks need to buy this stuff. All the healthcare companies need to buy this stuff. And then if you do buy like the bigger stuff, either Arbor or Ingenious or that, can they pay you to install it or do they just get boxes in the mail and a, and a PDF? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, we, we provide professional services. Okay. Um, and, and we also do work with partners. And so, for instance, it's not uncommon for you know, a large enterprise like, say, a GE or somebody to have some vendors of choice that they trust and they like to work with. You know, yeah. So we can work directly with them. Um, but we also have... Uh, on-site engineers okay. uh, in the hundreds <laughs> that are are NetScout employees but carry a Verizon badge or okay. carry a U.S. Bank badge. Okay. That's so it's not uncommon for us to install, you know, NetScout trained and, and paid employees to help companies utilize our tools inside their four walls. Okay. Cool. And so if people are going to be using your products. What about like certifications, training? Do you bother with certifications anymore? Like how does, can somebody become an expert in, in your stuff? Do you have? You yeah, know? if any one of your, your viewers would like to figure out, you know, how to make six figures and do something that's a whole lot of fun, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they should probably think about coming to NetScout Engage okay. uh, in April and getting certified as a, as a NetScout Ingenious, you know, uh, user. Okay. Um, and, um, those those jobs are in in really high demand, huh. um, and and there's just not enough people out there you know that know how to do it. Yeah. So we we typically have uh, about a thousand people at the the, the user conference, okay. uh, and it's it's one day of the typical stuff you'd expect, which is guys like me and our CEO and our other product leaders getting on stage and talking about what's important and what we care about as an industry. But then four days of intensive workshops, hmm. okay. you know, and it gets really fun because you get to learn from the experts at Arbor exactly how things like the Dyn attack took place yeah, okay. and what could have prevented it, huh. and and how, you know, Ingenious One and and Arbor Advanced Persistent Threat can work together, hmm. and how Ingenious Pulse, you know, that little thousand dollar device you're using actually integrates and works with Ingenious One. So you could see, you know, what external services 
you know, can be monitored and seen by Ingenious One and how you can drill all the way down to the packet. Hmm. Because sometimes to get to really complex problems, you have to open up that envelope. Yeah. You actually have to go into the packet and find out what's going on. Yeah. You know? So yeah, your viewers, um, I, I would be happy to have them become, you know, NetScout certified. That's cool. How much does something like Engage cost? For the, um, for the most part, uh, if you are a NetScout user, okay, yeah. it's free. Really? Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, people can come to the website and, and go to registration for Engage yeah. and register. And if they're if they're not a customer, um, what it would cost them is a conversation with a salesperson yeah, yeah. to identify that there's an opportunity. <laughs> and then the salesperson would say, you know what, I want you to Engage. <laughs> so you need a sponsor is basically how it works. Eli, if you want to come to engage, it's on me. Really? Yeah. Make them, make them. Because yeah. it's, it's like, but it's next year. It's like April or March or something. Yeah, it'll right? be in April. Yeah. April, yeah. okay. And we'll uh, be in Orlando at the Waldorf yeah. Astoria. Yeah, there you go. Um, I guess that's one of my questions, just, just one of the random questions when I talk with folks, is is having your own conference what the cool kids do now? Like, it seems like a number of years ago, you know, it used to be CES or Interop, or, and now it seems like Am Amazon and Cisco and everybody's just deciding to do their own conferences. Is that, do you, just so my folks at home know for events, is that? Eli, Eli, the, it's a royal pain in the ass. <laughs> this, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> really? Okay. You know, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's really, yeah, we have our, we have our conference, um, but, you know, look, it's not VMworld. It's yeah. not Cisco Live. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it really is a user forum. I mean, it's dedicated to educating and, and, and working with our customers. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, we're not trying to create some new trade show around the NetScout brand. We're just trying to take care of our customers. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the answer to your question is yes. It's what the cool kids are doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and it's expensive. Um, yeah. And it's, it's actually a problem. It's a problem for you know the people that watch your your videos because it used to be you could go to Interop yeah. and you could see everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and quite frankly, Interop is not really happening anymore. You know, it used to be you could go to Comdex yeah. and you know there was a hundred thousand, hundred twenty five thousand people there. Yeah, that's gone. Yeah, right. I mean, there's CBIT, but not too many Americans fly over to Hanover. You know, you know. And there's there's a Mobile World Congress, which is about the last large multi-vendor show around, but that's mobile and telecommunications. Okay. You know, it's not enterprise. Yeah. So I would I would love nothing more than you know one of the events companies to successfully put together another national, you know, you know trade show yeah. that we could all go to and and, and compete. Yeah. But they just seem to not be working out, so everybody's doing the smaller thing. Yeah, well, and you know, it's not so small anymore. I mean, uh, Dreamforce, oh, which yeah. was uh, Mark Benioff's little, you know, shindig, yeah, yeah. Uh, was 100,000 plus. Really? That big? Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah Cisco Live is about 25,000. Yeah. So is VMworld. Yeah. Um, I don't know what HP, Discover, and it'll be interesting to see what Dell does with, um, with EMC. Because EMC World is a pretty big show, and VM World is a big show, yeah. so maybe Dell could be the first almost industry trade show again. They could just pull all those brands together and and open it up for everybody else. That may not be such a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I know personally, I wonder what will happen. Because that's yeah, I, I get so many invitations to show. I mean, decent shows too, but there's just there's so many. It seems like I could go to one every week if I wanted to. Yeah, you pretty much could. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, okay. And then you were also talking about interesting things like with advertising. You were talking about some kind of film that you did. Was it Lo and Behold? Is that the name of it? Yeah, yeah. We, um, I, I, I am a big believer. I mean, I've been in this business for 30 years. Um, I, I started out as an engineer, um, you know, writing 6800 assembly. I was there for the first Um, You know, I've been around for a long time and I, I couldn't be more excited uh, and sanguine about the industry that we're in, the, the, the rate of change, um, you know, the kind of co compute power, processor power we have. I mean, when I got started, yeah. it was it was a dollar per instruction of compute, so a million dollars for a MIP. <laughs> Today it's less than seven cents. Okay. Yeah. So we went from a million dollars to under seven cents, <laughs> right? and it's going to be a penny yeah. in the next four years. <laughs> yeah. Now. 
when I started, it was half a million dollars for a gigabyte of storage. Wow. Today it's two cents. <laughs> It'll be a penny by, you know, probably the end of next year, right? Because yeah. you could buy a four terabyte drive for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Yep. So yep. that's a quarter, that's a quarter cent per, you know, per gig, right? Yeah. Um, compute. When I, I mean, network, when I started, it was a 300 baud modem. We were moving 300 bits per second. Yeah. Now we're at a hundred gigabits. That's an increase of 333 million times. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you start moving that fast, really amazing things can happen. And that's what's happened. We have a lot of accelerating returns. Yeah. You know, Kurzweil has stated that we're gonna have 20,000 times more progress in this century than we had in the last century. And the reason is, is because everything that we do, we're doing on top of a compute platform. Okay. It, took us, it took us over two years to map the first human genome at the turn of the century. Yeah. We now do it in two hours. So, Everything is moving faster and faster. And as you do that, things can go wrong very, very quickly. Yeah. And that's why it's important for people to kind of understand what's at stake. So what I did is I reached out to uh, one of my favorite directors of all time. His name is Werner Herzog. Okay. Uh, he's an absolute uh, icon in documentary and feature films. He's done like over 70 films in his life. Um, and I, I talked to him about telling this story about where the connected world came from, what we use it for, what the opportunities are, and, and, and where it can take us. And then what's the risk? What's yeah. the downside of it? Yeah. And with that, you know, we, we created this film and we, we submitted it to Sundance and it won the premier status at Sundance. Wow. Uh, and then I licensed it to Magnolia. Yeah. So Magnolia distributed it to 127 theaters in North America uh, this summer. Wow. Uh, it's now you could get it on iTunes, you could get it on Amazon, yeah. and I believe by Thanksgiving, oh, it's on DVDs on the 22nd, and it's on Netflix after that. Really? Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, so it's going to be available to everybody. Just go check out, lo and behold, Reveries of the Connected World. Yeah. And I will tell you that probably you're going to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. probably the best way to describe it. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to walk away having learned something but you're also going to walk away feeling a little bit uncomfortable <laughs> because we have become so incredibly dependent upon connectivity. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and in a couple of different ways, you and I look at our phones every morning when we get up, we check our email, we check our social feeds, we do our business. You would not have a business without the internet. <laughs> we, we, I think I'd be in the same place. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but what we don't, think about often is all of the other aspects of society that do the same thing. Okay. Our power grid is now dependent upon the internet. Yeah. That's not a good thing. Huh. You know, our hospitals are dependent upon connectivity. Yeah. You know, it used to be that a, a cyber criminal would think it was a good idea to go in and, and uh, encrypt Eli's computer and charge you a couple of bitcoins to unlock it. Well, that's child's play now. Why would I bother doing that when I can go take over a blood gas oxygen machine at Cedar sinai Medical and charge them a million dollars to unlock it? <laughs> you know, I can go take over an MRI, yeah. which is, you know, $10,000 a shot every time it takes a picture, Jesus. and I can lock that thing up for a week. <laughs> you know, what's that going to cost? Yeah. Huh. You know, I could hold a power utility hostage by telling them that I've invaded all of their, you know, their devices and their network, yeah. and I'm going to shut them down. So that's why what we do at NetScout is so important because we need to be able to monitor what's going through networks so we know what's a good packet, what's a bad packet. So that's why I created the film. And, and so it was really a public service announcement. Yeah. It was to explain to people that in, in just such a short period of time, we have irreversibly changed the framework of society. We have a $72 trillion global economy that would grind to a halt if we had a major web outage. Yeah. When the Dine, when Dine was attacked, yeah. which, um, where are you based, Eli? You're out west, right? No, no, Baltimore, Maryland. Twitter, Baltimore, okay. Yeah. I mean, just about, you mean Twitter, Reddit, yeah. Spotify, you know, Skype, you know, a whole bunch of services were down. Yeah. And people thought, well, I can't stream my favorite playlist to drive to work in the morning. Yeah, that's true. 
but there was also tens of millions of dollars of advertising that did not get delivered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. And there was probably a bunch of people that needed to access stuff that couldn't access it. Yeah. And it probably pissed them off a lot, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what Werner said to me, you know, Werner's 72 years old, so he said, Jim, what's the big deal? If the internet went down, we would just go back to the 1980s. How, that wouldn't be so bad. I mean, the 1980s was okay. I mean, the music wasn't great, but, you know, life was okay. Yeah. And uh, I said, no, Werner, we're not going to go back to the 1980s. Hmm. We're going to go back to the 1880s. Hmm. Because we don't know how to conduct ourselves like we did in the 1980s. Yeah. We don't have telex machines. We don't have fax machines. We don't have card and printers. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to get your Starbucks. You're not going to get your weather. You know, you're 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 not going to be able to go swipe a card and pay for your cab with your Apple Pay. Yeah. That's all over. It's done. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it's about. Oh, oh yeah, that's it. So is that did Net did Net Scout actually pay for that then? Is this? Yeah, Net Scout you? paid for that. Okay. Um, and it kind of falls into the financial realm of what I would pay for, you know, kind of typical video advertising yeah. throughout the course of a year. Huh. Um, but where it's different is I got my first check last month. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. So yeah. this this will be, you know, the first marketing campaign which will have paid for itself in and of or in and by itself. Yeah. It's not going to get paid for by the sales. It's going to get paid for by the sales of the film. <laughs> you know, so if it's if it has a positive impact on the company, which it already has had, yeah. had I mean, yeah. you know, how you measure something like this is um, when I joined NetScout, you know, we would average about two billion impressions a year, you know, in, on the web. OK. Yeah. Um, when I when I released the film at Sundance, we had nine billion that week. <laughs> Damn. Um, as of August of this year, we had twenty five billion. <laughs> wow. So. It, it, it's about getting noticed, and when you think about the world that we live in today, you know a lot of your your you included, yeah. and a lot of your viewers have never heard of NetScout. Yeah, yeah. the company is thirty years old. You know, <laughs> yeah. we've got dozens of patents. You know, we've got billions of dollars of business. We've got tens of thousands of customers, and you've never heard of us. Yeah, yeah. you know, so being trying to get out there and, and, and get public and get noticed is not is a non-trivial thing to do today. Yeah. The film was a way to do it differently. Really. That is, that's that's a very interesting way of doing it. I like the I like the idea of paying for marketing that ends up paying you. That'd be nice. That's nice, and I, and I think the other thing that's that's nice about it. And I believe me, I mean there are some naysayers, but there's there's value in corporations sponsoring the development of rich content. Yeah. I mean, hell, I'm preaching to the choir here. Look at you. I mean, you're a content guy, right? Yeah. Uh, there's value in people like us sponsoring you, because. You're, you're, you're developing, you're, you're educating the marketplace. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've looked at a number of your videos. And I'm like, oh, there's something I didn't know about. I didn't know Cujo existed. No, oh, okay. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, what Cujo can do for the home network, we do for large enterprises. Yeah. You know, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's a valuable thing. I think there's gonna be, we're going to see a lot more of it. But it's not going to be blatantly commercial. Hmm, if you go watch that film, you're not going to see a NetScout advertisement. Okay. You'll see at the beginning, that Scout presents Werner Herzog's Lo and Behold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you'll see us on the credits, and that's it. Huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's, I like that idea. Okay, I've been taking up a bit of your time, so get to the last few questions. Um, one of the interesting things is you folks have, um, you offer like a demonstration program where you'll send out demo equipment to some companies. Um, like if somebody's interested watching this, about what size company should they be if they would be interested in your demo program? Well, it depends on, on what you're interested in, in, in you know, testing. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that if, if you're talking about our flagship product, which is Ingenious One and Infinistream, yeah. um, you know, you're, you're probably going to be a company uh, of over you know, 200 to 250 people. No. Okay. Uh, that would be at the low end of our, our market. Yeah. Um, and and again, you're going to be spending $125,000 if you're buying hardware. If you're doing software alone, yeah. Uh, you know, we could get it down. Okay. Uh, you know, into the you know into the 50, 60k range. Um, but if you're, you know, obviously, you know, most of our customers are you know over a billion dollars in sales. Yeah. Um, but if you're you're in that you know 50 to 100 million dollar sweet spot area. You know, we have we have tools at scale. Okay. You know, the, the Fluke tools are very very useful to figure out what's going on in a network. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to be a huge company to get our attention. 
at all. Um, you know, go to netscout.com, contact a salesperson, call the 800 number. It's on the top of the website. Yeah. We'd be happy to walk through it with you. Okay, interesting. And then what, um, I had a question on top of my head. Anyways, um, I guess the final question that I'd have for you is, if you were 18 years old again, or if you had an 18-year-old kid, um, where in technology would you point them right now? Where, where do you think the best opportunities, realistic opportunities over the next five years are? Uh, you know, there are a lot of answers to that question, and I love that question. It's a good one. Um, I think that there is a tremendous amount of, of, of work to be done in security. Hmm. Okay. Um, I constantly get asked by C-level execs, where can we find more talented security people? Okay. Um, so, and, and don't be afraid, you know, I mean, when you're 18 years old, everything looks really daunting and hard and, you know, complex, but it's not. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's just a matter of applying yourself. Security is not different than anything else. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's, it's just more bits to deal with, right? Um, so I think security is a really interesting space. Um, right now, you know, we have a major shift in our industry, uh, you know, moving the cloud. Um, so, so what that does is it shifts the burden um, for a lot of enterprises of, of having to have a lot of the, the network design and development and deployment skills, you know, into large providers, right? Yeah. Um, so it, even most of the network engineers that I deal with today understand that they need to become software people okay, yeah. because we're, we're defining networks with software, yeah. we're programming networks with software. Um, as you go to software-defined networks, what's going to happen is that you use products like NetScout yeah. to, to monitor and trigger network traffic that then determines, do I need to provision a new circuit? Okay. Do I need to provision a new virtual machine, a new database, a new app server? Yeah. And, and the machines are going to do it on their own. Hmm. But what teaches those machines to do that is the programmer. Okay. So I, I would say that just everybody who watches your program should have basic programming skills. Yeah. Uh, they're not that hard to come by, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how I grew up. Yeah. I started with basic, and I ended up coding in C++. <laughs> right? uh, but today, the tools are amazing. I mean, you could do some amazing stuff. Now, having said that, if you don't want to be a bit head, yeah. uh, you don't want to write code, um, look at what you do today. Uh, understanding how to deal with digital content, there's a huge opportunity there. Yeah. Um, understanding how to use Adobe Premiere. Understanding how to do production work, understanding how to do user experience work. You know, what's what's the user interface look like? That's going to run on a tablet, on a phone, on a on a laptop. Um, that's really fun stuff, and it's in huge demand. Um, but it depends. If you're a creative person, I would say definitely become adept at at creating you know digital content, web pages, uh, infographics. Uh, become a graphic designer. Yeah. Uh, become a video editor. Um, you know, or if you're really more technical, uh, go down the path of, of understanding how to program and learn security and learn network design. I mean, I think that's what I would do. I guess that's one question I'd have for the folks. Like I always tell them, you know, back in 2000, the idea was your MCSE, you get your CCNA, you make money. So basically you stay within those stacks. Do you think people will stay within stacks for their entire career? Like... Like if somebody started using your products, do you think they would they would literally like build their career over ten or fifteen years just with one set of products? If you had asked me that ten years ago, I'd probably say yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, today I'll say not a chance. <laughs> not a chance. Okay. Yeah. Not a chance. Um, look, at, there's gonna there's a ton of people you know who are watching this program, who are gonna spend more time being driven in a car than driving a car, hmm. in their lifetime. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, long distance trucking is going to be done by robots, right. you know, every single day in, in, in less than five years. <laughs> um, if you think you're going to have a career as a telemarketing person, yeah. forget it. <laughs> you know, that's going to be done by a robot. Yeah. Um, if you think that you can make money as a receptionist, you know, maybe for a hedge fund or a law firm, yeah. but you're not going to be doing it for long. Yeah. You know, so anything that can be done with an algorithm is going to be done with an algorithm. Uh, Apple did not bring manufacturing back to the U.S. because they were feeling good about being patriotic. Yeah. They brought it back because they had 25,000 light industrial robot that could replace three Asian workers, you know, all over three eight-hour shifts. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't get sick, and it doesn't go on strike, and it's not part of a union, and that's what's going on. So 
you and and when I talk about things moving fast, Eli, I mean it sincerely. I mean there are going to be jobs. You know, we had this recent election where you know Donald Trump said, "Well, I'm going to bring those manufacturing jobs back, and I'm going to I'm going to go hard on trade." Yeah. Well, look, pal, the cows have left the building. You know, <laughs> you're not bringing those jobs back because those jobs are gone. You know, we don't do it that way anymore. If you go to the mini computer factory outside of Oxford in England, it was 6,500 English workers building minis before BMW bought it, turned it into a robotic factory. Now there are 1,400. Damn. And they are not welders, they are computer operators. Yeah. <laughs> and they get paid more, but yeah. there's fewer of them. Yeah, okay. Right? So robotics, I mean, what a great place. You know, yeah. go into robotics. Yeah. Awesome stuff, um, you know. And then obviously, you know, go into biology. You know, that's that's a huge space. Yeah. You know, chemistry and biology, the things that are going there. I mean, if you look at the um, the, the recent winners of the Nobel, you know, prize for biology, you know, they're building nano machines. Yeah. You know, they've got a little car that's the thousands the size of a, of a human hair that can drive through your body. All right? right. You know, that's pretty cool stuff. Genetics, that's really cool stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think. Um, and if that doesn't float your boat, then be a plumber or an electrician, <laughs> yeah. you know. And I'm not saying be a contractor because probably our homes are going to be 3D printed in the next 20 years, you know. But. Yeah. Cool, cool. Thank you. So um, so are there any, any final thoughts for the people at home? Any any special offers or anything or anything they should well, do? Well, I, I think uh, my final thought is you've tested an air check, right? Yeah, yep. We have to get you an OptiView. Okay. Well, sounds good. I'm going to check that out. And okay. then maybe a, a, an Ingenious Pulse. Yeah, I would like to take one of the, look at one of those. Yep. Yeah, and uh, let's see if you can learn the other stuff, and then maybe one of these days you'll come out to engage, and we'll show you how the real big iron works. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, uh, so thank you for being with me. And um, if, if people want more information, is just netscout.com. Netscout.com. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Yeah.